everybody for, for coming. Uh, I think everybody's on this way. Can have their, their coffee. Glad about everybody here. Okay, again, thanks for your time today. My name is Mark Forsyth. I'm the oil and gas business development manager for the ASEAN region. Um, we've also brought in a, a number of people from Cisco today that have global roles so that we can share with you what else Cisco is doing on, on the global stage so that we can uh, share a lot of the technology here locally, along with a number of our key partners. So coming from the, from the oil and gas business my, myself, my background is in geology and, and geophysics, interpretation, this sort of thing. Um, we certainly have to adhere to what we know is most important to our industry with a health and safety briefing moment. So if I can get everybody's attention very quickly, I just want to point out that um, we're here in, in Salon 2, so that's our location. There is no safety drill plan for today. If you need to get out for any particular reason, what you can do is walk out of our door, turn to your left, and just pass the registration booth out here. There are a, a set of escalators. You have to go down two sets of escalators. That's going to have some street level of the lobby. And then you walk directly out to the lobby, and, uh, and uh, there's a muster point out there in front of uh, the hotel. Everybody, everybody okay with that? Consider with that? Good. Okay. So uh, further on, for our, our first uh, discussion today is going to be presented by Sergey Konovalov. <coughs> Sergey, Sergey is the vertical industry solutions lead um, with our solutions group, and um, Sergey is going to be talking today about a number of connected um, items in the oil and gas segment, from refineries to pipelines and so on. So Sergey, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, let's do that. Let's just do a quick introduction if you don't mind. Can I just have everybody hold up their hands that is here with Cisco? Okay, very good. What we're going to do is, let's, let's just do this very quickly. Um, I just want to, you to know, give your position, where you're based, and a brief bit about what your role is with the company so that everybody here knows who is here from, from Cisco. Young, would you, would you start? Yeah, I'm Wendy Gusnov of the equator right now. That's where I am. <laughs> Um, I'm actually based out from Singapore. I look after the partnership uh, uh, alliance program. What it really means is in the light of um, you know our partners Honeywell, Rockwell, Emerson, and so forth. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Rene. Yeah, I'm the global manager of the central uh, industries, looking for the industry energy, which is utilities and oil and gas. Okay. Thanks very much, um, Alan. Oh, sorry, um, Farrell, would you, okay. would you go ahead? I'm uh, Farrell, uh, I'm the uh, accountant for the oil and gas account in the uh, Asia Tech, uh, typically uh, in the lack of Exxon Mobil, TV Shell, and Tech. Okay, very good. Um, was it not Miss? Yeah. Uh, I'm Derek, I'm a account manager with the uh, Global Enterprise Team, um, looking after the uh, region for accounts, um, accounts after the year, and now we see Shell. Okay, great, thanks very much. Um, and then uh, our partners will be presenting today as well. Let's uh, let's cover them. Didi, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Didi Smalan uh, from Side Electric. I'm the uh, uh, behind the solution architect from Side Electric. Great, great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Jonas. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jonas Birch. I'm with uh, Emerson. And also one of the Cisco partners. I'm the director of applied technology, which means that uh, yeah, I help you know users like yeah some of you uh, uh, adopt new technologies such as uh, Internet of Things. You know, so yeah, Cisco kind of make the things and it sort of make, makes the internet. And, and, and Emerson, we kind of make the, the things. You know, like the, the, the sensors. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very very much, gentlemen. Would you mind making a brief introduction and here at the table in front? Could you give us a brief intro? Yes, yeah. please, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Chakot from BC Innovation Thailand. Uh, my role is the IT provider in one of my customers. Every year, we uh, have a business from Taiwan, a big company in the country. Okay, thank you very much. And the table there, we can start with the next one. I'm uh, Joey from Exxon, I'm from the uh, IT engineering portion. So we come up with solutions in the office, and now we also come up with solutions in the plant area. So sooner or later, we want to be happy family. Thanks very much. Please just to your right. Thank you. Oh, 
My name is Raymond. I'm from Tucson. I don't get into it. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Dunford from CGG. So, seismic exploration. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nishida. I'm, I'm come from the Impex. I'm based in uh, Jakarta. I'm in charge of the Matra project, uh, floating energy project, and I'm uh, in charge of the IM and the IT. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andres. I'm the Cisco AM from Jakarta. I'm speaking about Okay. Thank you, Andres. I'm sure I didn't get you introduced first. <laughs> Uh, hi, hi everyone. My name is uh, Alvin. Uh, I'm from Shell. So I'm the uh, IM and IT uh, manager for um, the East uh, refineries uh, and focusing on much of the migration. For East Malaysia? Uh, no, the, in the East region. So Go that's ahead. Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines. And Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Hi, uh, morning. Uh, my name is Kimo. I'm the uh, IM IT manager for Pulau So I'm accountable for the uh, IT. Okay. Okay. My name is Andy Sim uh, from Exxon Mobil, IT uh, in LA. Very good. And you're based here in Singapore? Yes, I yes. Am. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much. Can we start with the, the back table, please? <coughs> uh, my name is Klaus Menzo. I'm based in Singapore. I'm with BP. And I'm with a small unit called Digital Innovation Office. And as you can imagine, we're trying to bring digital technologies innovation into the large organization. And we're about 15 people. I'm the only one in Asia. The rest is in somewhere else in London and in Houston. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Thank you. My name is Tang. Okay, I'm from uh, Omega, a telecom system integrator for oil and gas, petrochemical, and also for marine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Christophe Bega from Schneider Electric, Vice President for the oil and gas for Asia Pacific. Hi, uh, yes. I'm the uh, program manager for the IT infrastructure group. Basically, uh, I manage a global infrastructure project for the market. Okay, thank you very much. Hood, can I ask you to start at this table, please? Hi, my name is Hood. I'm the head of IT for MISC. We are primarily shipping. Uh, we ship your products to the rest of the world. That's <laughs> why <laughs> we also own about a dozen FSOs, FSOs, and uh, Mopus and one at PS at the moment, together with Shell, at least. Right. And we also have a school and logistics as well. And we also build, uh, fabricate a lot of your rigs, jackets, and top sides in Johor across the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm a sick boy in the dark. I thought you would do Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so yes. uh, at Jung, I'm a Vietnam director of Vietnam Petroleum Institute. Uh, I am the IE body of Vietnam. So we also work in innovation and communication. So we think for the oil gas industry. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, I think that. Oh, no, no, please. please. Uh, I'm sorry, my name is So. I uh, come from uh, Petro Vietnam. Uh, I have a technology visa and that's in the e-commerce program. I'm very interested in the company. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Mr. So. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Have we covered it? Uh, sorry, Renee? Yeah, before we begin, the, the group is small enough to ask questions when you want. I mean, you'll try to keep the track on time and stuff like that, but please, interaction is what we love. The slides you will get anyway. So if you have questions, please. Uh, uh, ask them. There's also an app which uh, you can use, which was told this morning. You can type in your question, it will be handled there, and we can discuss it afterwards. So, but please ask questions, that's very valuable for both of us. Okay, thanks. Good, good point. Thanks, thanks very much. Okay, with that, let's get started. Sir, please, uh, please, please. Yeah, I think we have quite a busy day. We have a lot of interesting things to share with you. Uh, what's happening with uh, internet of things, internet of everything, with oil and gas. So I've been working with oil and gas for the last 12 years. Um, I've been working with some of you, with some of your headquarter companies, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, P, um, and so uh, I'm going to sh share some of the things that we've learned and we did together. So I think as Ray mentioned, uh, I hope the 
room is quite small, so let's just keep it friendly and please do ask questions. I would really like to get your feedback. And I will be asking questions as well if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, let's get started. So, I want to start with the reality of it. <laughs> It is, it is a reality of a new world, I think, as we, I mean, it's a new economic reality and it's a new crisis. Uh, and you're, it's clearly in use. Uh, I'd probably say that the oil and gas industry doesn't like to be in use. Usually, oil and gas industry in use is only for something that happened or a crisis or something. So, so anyway, this is, this is, this is quite, a, quite a big shock, right? If you can just look back into a year from now, we had this conversation a year ago, uh, things changed. Things change quite dramatically. Uh, that's the clearly reality. Um, I probably don't want to ask what is your opinion, what's the price will be by the end of the year. So there are different, uh, different views here, but clearly the impact that we've seen happen in the, in the industry. So that's something that we're also trying to, to look into how companies are trying to readjust. So, well, we're just looking to the region, which is another example so for uh, drilling rigs. We had 180. Uh, drilling rigs in operation the last year, and we have only 83 hectares today. It's another testament of the, of the reality that we face today. So, I think you may think about what's, what actually will happen with the technologies and will the companies continue to invest. Uh, I saw some of you responsible for innovation and <coughs> new, new technologies. Will this continue? And clearly, the industry is in a different economic uh, reality today. So, I want to show you. This is an interesting view. It actually been developed in around 1970s by a professor who's now part of the Harvard, um, Harvard University. And he actually looked into, um, and this is a very controversial to what economic theory would say, because economic theory would say that uh, it was the situation probably the last thing we might see, but the reality is it's actually this is not the case. So what you can see on this, on this picture, and I tried to put some oil and gas as well, so just to bring it close to the reality. So, and what it, what it actually tells us that if we're looking to the time when we have high margins of operations, so we can look the oil price is 150 or higher, right? Where, where are we? So, I think that's the, that's the sort of era we have been into. And surprisingly or not, actually, the topic of innovation was, was discussed quite a lot. But the companies were so busy to build new stuff, to go out and develop new fields and so forth and so forth that the innovation per se, people were mainly interested, it was just a topic interest, interesting for a conversation. It wasn't a necessity for the business. Uh, you can still deliver, you can still make money. So if we look into the extreme end, so I hope we're not going to slice that down, uh, where the oil price sort of goes into the corridor of $30, $20, and we're not going to be there. This is, well, this is clearly where there probably will be low also abilities to innovate and invest in technologies. And this is a golden sort of period where actually we can make money, but we have to be smart. This is the view that sort of, I think it's sort of reflects the reality. We see interest in technology, we see companies are looking for every opportunity to create some savings prior to the definition. And technology is clearly a uh, and playing a big role in all yes. I don't know, this is a controversial view. I would be interested to hear your feedback as well uh, in the break. What do you think? What is happening in your organization? But that's sort of what we see in the market. So I uh, just want to bring a bit of an optimism that while the future has changed, uh, this is what's happening. I want to show one example here. This is a manufacturing the discussion that's happening in a separate room, the manufacturing industry. And if you can think about the manufacturing industry, from where they work, okay, a lot of the manual and labor work and work into where they are. That transition from here to here didn't happen because they were fancy new technologies, they love robotics uh, and, and something, it was just about innovation. It was about business reality. It's a tough competition that they faced in manufacturing and they just realized that if they continue doing this, they're not going to survive. They have to do it differently. A lot of companies have invested, and we see a lot of innovation which came from Asia. It just had to do it, had to do it in a more efficient way, very efficient manufacturing. So that's what, if you will, the economic theory is making sort of the competition and sort of tough reality. So that's what I think the oil and gas companies uh, will be going for. So we're going to see more of this uh, 
in this new era uh, of the new world. So, just example, uh, this is a technology uh, drilling automation. Now, a lot of companies are talking about it. I think we have a presentation from Shell, and Shell is one of those companies that invests as well in, in, in drilling automation. A lot of companies are also working on this. And drilling automation have been discussed for many, many years. And we haven't seen that becoming close in reality. So a lot of discussion, but we're still there. But we will see how that is changing dramatically. Because companies are looking exactly for those efficiencies. So we're going to see this becoming more and more. I'm going to share a bit more as we go over it, so just to give you an idea about what actually happening on the drill innovation side. I just want to share it with you. Uh, I think this is going to be a future, uh, hopefully not so far distant future. So. so, if we look into the, there was discussion today about the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything. So, how big is the opportunity? Is the opportunity is really there? So, can we, can we? Make business results on deployment to know that would be sufficient for us to justify not only the cost but also help us to operate in the economic environment. So, we have done analysis. So, this is analysis done by the Cisco Consulting Services team. And they have tried to analyze it to say where those focus opportunities are in the industry and how big is this. So, and it's not a secret why so we came up with uh, these main drivers as a driver, as a driver opportunity, upstream, downstream. Clearly, the answer is the opportunity is there. The technology clearly can help us to operate more effectively and also reflect the reality of the economy. So that's sort of where we are. This is a very exciting analysis. A lot of your senior management have, I mean, they went to visit us, um, they asked, well, can we look a bit more deeply into those who want to understand the economic zones and some of the details? So we actually have done some of this analysis for a couple of our key customers just looking into their balance sheet. And in most of the cases, it turned out very well. So, okay, so this is the economic part of the, of the story. So, I'll give you a couple of examples, and we're going to talk about those examples today. Where, where are the results? What are the results we have seen? I would say, clearly, in the current economic environment, we see more, I would say, activities going in the downstream. So, for those of you in downstream, probably you can remember the time when. Downstream wasn't a priority, everyone was about upstream, 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 upstream. Um, you've seen some of the customers they're saying, do you want to buy a refinery? So it's, it's not happening anymore. So downstream again is popular, it's money making, it's a good money making part of the business. And there are a lot of optimization that can be done in downstream. And we have seen those examples um, already happening. Midstream, we're going to talk today about pipelines. <laughs> This is a large part of the uh, oil and gas operations, and we have seen a lot of the things happening with the brownfield pipelines. Companies are trying to really review how they operate the assets, uh, reduce those leakages. And I'm going to share with you one interesting technology that is, uh, is now available for the market that can help dramatically uh, change it. We're going to talk a little bit more about the pipelines uh, later on in the day. And then the final one is upstream. So um, I would say the upstream, what we have seen is the interest has shifted. From, if you will, from probably too much focusing on the exploration side to you know, more focusing on the development and production. A lot of the fields which are already explored they still continue to continue development and production. And how we can take more from the existing uh, production facilities, how we can increase the production. So, um, I will mention one example that we're working on, which is about enhanced soil recovery. And some of the interesting ideas and knowledge that can help to optimize and see oil field in a very, very different and fresh way. So, as we go through this presentation, I'm going to bring you close to probably wondering what are we doing on the technology side, and where the technology comes from, how we can make it all of this real, so where are the realities come from. I think the first level of reality that we see is in connectivity. I mean, we clearly need to bring this information, bring this visibility. That's sort of the first, first step that we're making in this trajectory. A lot of legacy assets, a lot of unconnected assets that we need to we need to connect and bring this what some call it trap data. It's a data that is available. It's right there at the edge, but you don't have the visibility across all your asset base um, of this information. So connecting assets, bring this data. Now when you bring this data, the question is what are you going to do with that? So you need to think about how you're going to process data. And this is where we talk about the big data analytics. Uh, 
uh, for a shared example, um, of the big data as well. Those analytics are clearly taking a big role, big role in this. And final one is the results. Is it people, processes, and control? Is exactly what are we doing with all of those? It's all great connectivity. It's all great about the big data analytics. Uh, where are the outputs come? Right? Trying to measure and connect all of this together is very, very important. So this is to us, if you ask us, what is Internet of Things? And I know it's a very ambiguous word, but what is it? I think this is where it's all of this comes together. And with all of this, it makes a pure economic sense. That's, that's what we mean by Internet of Things. <coughs> challenges. So let me give you a couple of examples of challenges. And um, in those people who work in innovation, we're going to highlight one of the specific challenges. Challenges, one of the first challenges is reality of the connectivity. Right. Um, and this is an example, this is we're probably trying to make things very dramatic. We're going to show you, uh, in this case, this is the offshore assets that is connected to satellite. Uh, it's 256 k connectivity, and sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less. So, but a difficult thing to get we have seen. What we have seen, this is a from one of the projects that actually uh, some of our partners, CDCs, are executing. They're saying to us that if I design, uh, it was designed to have 17 different networks. Okay, all of those 17 different 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 networks will require to have 30 tons of cabling um, that that needs to be installed to support those 17 different networks, and it also require 33 cubic meters of space to um, host the cabling trains and junctions and all of that. So, and the opportunity that the team had worked with. Renee as well worked with as well. They actually looked into how we can optimize this and how can we actually move from 17 into the three networks. So there are clearly space for optimizations, clearly to make things a bit more simple, a bit more efficient. Okay. This is just an example uh, to show you where, where, where we're going. Big data. Um, on a big data, what we see is a new type of a sensor that is coming. Um, it's called distributed acoustic sensor. Some some of you know what the technology. Okay. Distributed acoustic sensing is a I think from what I'm hearing uh, actually from, from you guys um, is that uh, this is one of the technologies that is going to change quite dramatically uh, oil and gas industry and not only oil and gas industry but also will, will affect the transportation as well as public safety. What the technology does technology allows you to put a sensor. So the sensor looks like it's just a box, small, small unit that connects to standard fiber optic cable. And that fiber optic cable can go up to 80 kilometers in length. And what you can do is you can listen to the acoustic signals and vibration around that fiber optic cable, leveraging this one unit. Okay, so that gives you very good visibility. The reason why it's called distributed is because you can listen up to every five meters like a separate microphone. Okay, but you don't have microphone. Your microphone is the cable. The cable itself is a microphone. If you would have a cable running through this room, we could listen to very clearly conversation in this room, in the other room, and for the whole building. Okay, maybe the building nearby. Leveraging is only one small unit, one small sensor. It's a fundamentally interesting technology. And oil and gas, and not only oil and gas industries, are really excited about this technology. This is an example from the upstream. We have a couple of our customers that actually, what they do, they put the optical cable um, on the production stream and they, they put it down the hole. So suddenly, that optical cable now gives you visibility of all the information, all the noise uh, down the hole. Okay. So that noise can be translated into the information. So suddenly, you start to see the information about the flow rates. You can see which perforation down the hole are working well, which perforations are not working well. You can do sizing on demand. You can do it whenever you want, at any point in time. So, this is just an example. It's a it's a really really impressive technology. Why why mentioning this? This technology generates about two terabyte of data per well per day. A lot of data. Okay, so. Usually when people say big data, to me this is this is really big. This is really big. It's a lot of data. So we're looking into uh, how we can actually manage it because you can't send all of this data through the satellite. Right? You have to you have to be smart. You have to do something different. Anyway, just to give you an example, it's not the case in 
all the scenarios, all the use cases, but I want to make the picture a bit dramatic just to show you this is coming and this is happening in oil and gas. But it's very, very exciting. So for those of you who's going to visit us in San Jose and Cisco, we will have a live setup showing this acoustic sensor and how we manage it now. Uh, if you're going to be there, just let us know. We'll be happy to show you how this technology is going to So three key areas. So let's go down into the basics. So and see about what are the three key elements that make Internal of everything. What is, what is it that's, that is different about the internal of everything? Right. There probably, there's those three areas, and you can probably argue there are probably things here and there, but we want it to be simple, a bit more crystallized and use. You can see where, where the difference comes from. So I'm going to talk about um, three of them briefly. So the first one is convergence. Right? So we have seen in IT, it's, it's happening, right? it, it's happened already. Data, voice, video, all those systems are running on one, one infrastructure. Right? I remember the time when it was a big debate about voice and separate telephony teams. Then we have the talk sort of saying never voice, it's going to be there, it's going to be separate. And then we have seen some of the companies developing hybrid. Do you remember, do you remember hybrid uh, PPS? I can see some people. <laughs> so that happened as well. Now there's no hybrid. Now it's clear that IP is the, is the transport key. It's reliable transport for time. We can make sure that it's reliable and it's full. So we're going to see it with some examples uh, later on today. We're going to see that we see the same happening in the OT side, in the operational side of the world. What we have seen over the last probably five, ten years is the transition towards IP in each of those subsegments. We have seen the video move towards IP, so operational video runs over IP. Scada system probably moved to IP pretty quick because it just makes sense uh, to run the SCADA system over IP over long distances. You can't run, run serial very effectively over long distances, so this is where transition happened pretty quick. And we have seen the process control domain have moved towards IP. So a lot of the systems, if you open, if you go into those systems, you'll find their Ethernet switches and you will find their IP product. Yes, there are some other protocols that run on top of that that can be specific. Um, well, the basic level is IP and Ethernet is there. This is happening. So, you probably can say, this is coming. Okay? Maybe some of you can even argue with me and say, this is already reality. This is already happening. So, the project that I mentioned uh, that we're working on, for example, for the offshore, this is a good example of where actually companies are putting it all together. This is how they're taking the 17 different systems and putting it into the three different uh, infrastructures. You still want to keep maybe safety as a separate system. It's just by design. Uh, safety systems are designed to be just if everything else fails, that's that's what's going to support you. But the rest of the systems can effectively operate from the one infrastructure. So and then you can probably ask what's the future? And this is sort of, if you will, the long term, this this whole session is about the future. Where are we going and what's going to happen? So we see this is pretty much it's, it's not too far. And moreover, some of you is actually currently deploying projects which are very close to this nature where all of this comes together. We think what we believe is actually, and you can probably discuss with me in a couple of years from now, is it happening or not, but I can, I can probably make some bets that I would see that IT and OT will converge together. It will be one organization. Uh, I see a lot of executives coming to us, and the first thing they ask them to say, what are we, what are we, what are we suggesting to do? What, what is needs to happen? So, Anyway, that's sort of what we, what we see is coming. Security. Let me just go quickly and we're going to have a bit more deep dive with you. So I'm just going to share with you some of our experience on process and problem based security and what we have done. But cyber security is the big issue uh, for the industry. Not only for oil and gas, but I think for energy industry as a whole, but also for manufacturing, for transportation, and so forth. Uh, for various reasons. One reason is that it had been a bit uh, overlooked. So people have not been focusing too much. It was sort of security by obscurity. Uh, they were thinking that, well, these systems are so complex that probably people were not able to learn and figure out, so that's why they were not able to hack it. But we have seen this happen, right? Uh, we have seen bad examples, so I don't want to talk too much about Stuxnet, but probably most of you have heard about Stuxnet. Also, bad example, but there are things happen after Stuxnet as well. So I can clearly say that security now is the number one topic or executive level conversations. Just maybe three, four years ago, uh, people would consider that security is the, it's a technical topic. 
now if you go to the portable level, um, they're talking about security. This is one of the reasons that oil and gas companies are not managing well today, and that's something that we can actually help with. Effectively. So what's the difference here? Um, OT versus IT uh, security. So in OT, the priorities are slightly different. We're more concerned about availability, we're more concerned about integrity, and we're less concerned about confidentiality. Right? And it's very different in IT. So roughly that's sort of the uh, level that we have seen. Uh, we have also special protocols that we have to work with. And the final thing is to say what we are looking to do. And the system is investing very heavily in cybersecurity for uh, industrial control systems. Is trying to make it simpler. Because usually the system and the security have to be operated by the people who are more or less running also some part of the control domain infrastructure, control engineers. And they are really struggling. They really don't like complexities and they want to have everything simple, something they can plug in and run. So sometimes security doesn't work like that. We have to put more effort into it, but as simple as possible. That's what we call it. Some of our management call it make it simple like electrician. Just go there, plug in, and it's easy to use. So simplicity has to be key here. It can't be complex. It can't be CCIEs that will be running security for the space. It has to be simple, but it has to be very efficient. But we're going to talk more about this uh, later on today. I'm going to share with you uh, some of the great development that we did uh, actually with Shell. Um, so. All right, now the final one that I want to mention what's the difference about the internet of everything, these sort of things, is um, fault computing. How many of you have heard about fault computing before? No? You? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Very good. So, fault computing. Um, this, this sort of terminology of fault computing, we have introduced it about a year ago. So it's relatively a year, plus or minus, relatively new technology development, but very exciting uh, technology development for oil and gas. We were very surprised to see how oil and gas industries are interested and jumped onto the fault computing. Okay, let me explain what it is uh, before I go and share with you where the excitement is coming from. This is very simplistic again. Super simplistic view of the traditional computing infrastructure. We went through mainframes, we went into PC, and now we're sort of back into cloud era of the infrastructure world. But uh, basically, where we are now is we have endpoints, we have cloud data center elements, and we have interaction between the two. What for computing comes? For computing is, is a layer that is adding very close to the edge, it's not in the middle, it's very close to the edge. And that additional layer allows us to do data processing before we send this data into the cloud. So, all computing is an extension to the cloud. All computing is not a replacement for the cloud, right? It's an extension to the cloud. So suddenly your applications from the cloud can execute some of the analytics, um, some of the computing as close as possible to the data. Right? And this is very interesting for LGS because as close as you get to the edge, the more reach of the data you have available, right? The Comes you go to the cloud, to the data center, uh, the data set becomes a big, a big difference. So that's why cloud computing is very, very interesting. So, from a Cisco side, you're going to hear from us. We are making cloud computing a reality through different ways. And why, one of the ways we did it is we call it IOX. IOX. So, for some of you who know our products like 819, if you have interacted with that product, uh, we'll be Two products that will come up uh, later this year. One is 829 and 809. Those products have iOS, which run the routing and security, and they also have a container that allows us to host application. So this fork is actually is not an additional appliances. This is, can be executed right already in the network equipment. So that's our, this is our real so I want to make it a bit real and I'll show you what's exciting ha things happening about fault computing. So what's happening with, with the fault computing? So we have a couple of partners that came to us very, very quickly and said, look, this is, this is exactly what is needed. It simplifies it to make it easier. Uh, we would like to, to go ahead and start, start piloting this technology. So probably the first use case I'm going to start with is about data quality. Uh, it's one of the one of the interesting use cases is actually how we can ensure that the data that we receive from the edge is a quality data. Right? We don't send a lot of the rubbish uh, data into the data analytics. Because then the data analytics is as long as good as the data is good. So we need to make sure the data quality is easy. So we can do data quality processing at the edge to make sure that 
data comes in the right format uh, into our model environments, um, and also maybe sometimes aggregated data sets. You don't need all the data, you want to have all the aggregated data sets, maybe for that specific uh, part of the oil field uh, or the oil section. So this is one example. Um, probably one of the interesting example um, I'm really excited about. Uh, this is about the enhanced oil recovery, because this is sort of true essence of the four comes into play. It's not only about sending the data through. What we're actually doing, we are putting in some of the algorithms of artificial data um, right here, close to the oil fields. So we're looking at the well pad, well pad level. And we're allowing those algorithms uh, of artificial data, actually, those well pads, they can talk to one another. And in the oil field, they will define the right artificial width uh, operation uh, right there, and pretty much cloud with only a little bit more straight at the moment. But they will exchange with one another, and they will share information between the two, and it all will happen right there. At the edge. And the only thing you have to do is you only have to measure, uh, sorry, monitor all of this, and orchestrate from the cloud level. So this is really exciting development um, that we're working on the hands um, on um, let me bring you one more example of these connecting legacy. We have a lot of legacy to connect to. Uh, and what we did is we partnered with companies like Voice I Soft. And we allow Voice I Soft to have their um, adapters and their interfaces to be as part of this for computing application. And that allows us right there at the edge to connect to a variety of the legacy and proprietary interfaces and bring this data into the Voice I Soft format. So this is, this is very, very um, and maybe the final one I'm going to mention is the drilling automation. So for drilling automation, why POG is interesting is because it allows us, POG can execute, and this is sort of what, we, what we're working on, can execute not only the uh, non-real-time applications, but also we're looking to execute in real-time applications as well. So we can execute some of the drilling automation algorithms as well as part of the POG. So just to give you an example, and I know this is a, sometimes maybe seen as a vision and direction, but this is a very hot area. All right, uh, so we go, go to the end. Uh, and people ask the question, okay, this is all exciting, this is all where things are going, but how are we going to make it happen? And I don't know, what do you feel? But we we keep asking this question that, and people come to us and say, look, we have a separate IT team and we have a separate OT team and sometimes they talk, sometimes they don't talk. Uh, I have seen in some organizations actually very bad is actually they say, this is a cable, even that's, you are on that end, I'm on this end. So it can go very, very nicely. So how can we make it happen? So uh, let me share with you what we do from the system side. So what, we, what we're working on is just to make things easier. We are launching, later this year, we're launching a new certification. For those of you who know uh, CCNN, CCMP, Trex. Uh, I don't know if we're going to go to CCMP. It's a bit uh, too sophisticated. But CCNA, I think it's very basic, but as well very powerful uh, education. And this education we do for control engineers and as well as for network engineers. So if you will, this is the training for control engineers to learn about the network and learn about security, and for network engineers to learn about the control systems, basic dual control, how things are designed, safety to systems. So each team is actually come together. And what we expect, actually, we expect from organizations, uh, like your organizations, actually the two teams from both of the organizations will be sent to the same training. I think this is where it will be a, a biggest efficiency from this rent. So that's something that we do. We're going to announce it and launch it in the level. So let us know if you're interested in, in this specific part. So this is a trade, making sure we share it. Knowledge is power. And I think the more we share it, the more we're helping the IT team to learn about basics on uh, convergence, about industrial wireless, helping them to understand how to design things for that right and work very well for collaboration and so forth and so forth. A lot of things that are can be mutual. The, thing, the other thing that we do, we're going to talk about this today, and this is a responsibility of uh, my team and my group. Uh, we are looking after the validation of designs and architectures. So we're going to talk today about pipelines, we're going to talk today about the refineries and, and processing facilities. And you see there those validated designs we need to get our system with, with our industry partners. Um, and the goal here, by the way, I'm, I'm using this word system related designs. Are you familiar with this? I, how many of you have seen system related designs? Okay, I see any hands. 
maybe a bit shy. Uh, we do have actually uh, already a couple of the Cisco related designs published at the Cisco.com. Uh, it's about, it's quite a large document actually, it's a 500 page document. Um, and the document that we currently have available, it was put together with Oracle Automation for the partners uh, you might have seen outside. And that document is focusing pretty much just on the basics and it looks into how to design industrial networks, uh, which topologies to choose, uh, ring topology, star topology, how do you, how do you build security layer, what do you do <coughs> control, and, and that's pretty much what it covers. It covers the basis of industrial network design. Uh, what we're working on, and we're going to talk today about pipelines and other ones, is to do very similar documentation, but very specific to a, a, a um, specific task base. So we'll talk about refinery, we'll be system of the design that we have done that work already with, uh, with Emerson. Uh, and this is a good example of a validation where Emerson and Cisco are sort of demonstrating and showing how to design the networks, how to design industrial wireless, uh, which is approved from two sides. We're going to talk about pipelines today as well. So this is what we're doing. And maybe the final thing is to mention what are we working on to make it as well help when we're also building the, what we call rapid prototyping kit. Uh, all of those ideas that you have seen, Samsung's, uh, we have seen you coming to us and saying that we like the idea, but it's so big, where do I start? Where do I go? How can I have a bit of a test of it? How can I have a flavor of it? Uh, so what we what you're gonna see from us, we're gonna build for all of the offerings, we're gonna build the rapid prototyping kits that will be available for you, and those kits will allow you actually to start if you're looking to put into industrial wireless uh, some of the use cases, that kit will allow you to really simply really basically start looking into industrial wireless. If you're looking into security, so how we can help you to keep a sense of what how powerful those tools are. So I want to conclude my story and um, this is, will be our agenda for today. So something that we're going to go into. So we're looking into all the developments on the system side that I mentioned about the validation of those developments and partnership in these cases. Um, we put it all in structured format. Um, I hope you all made sense. So as you can see, we put all of our developments on upstream side under the connection well fields. Uh, we have put all of our uh, midstream and pipelines and then what we call processing facility. Uh, probably there's some flavor there on the downstream, but we also see some of the customers actually taking the same ideas and the same learnings and bringing them to the upstream processing facilities as well as some upstream production facilities. So you're going to see some similarities there. So what's going to happen today is we will cover, uh, we'll start with the pipelines, we'll go into the pipelines, uh, and then we're going to cover what we have done in the secure operations and some of the use cases, some examples from there. We're going to touch back a little bit to the oil field and show you some of the legal operations and funds. Um, and then we will we'll conclude uh, with the connected processing plans and a discussion that Emerson is going to share with you about the instruments and what's, what's happening in the wireless system. So this is sort of our agenda today. So what do you expect from Cisco? You're going to expect more information and more detail on each of those areas. And sort of, this is our strategy, this is our plan, this is what we're doing, and this is what we're going to see more from us. So I think with that, uh, I've been shown that we are running on time a little bit, so I think we're good on time. So with that, I think we just will make a position now to connect the pipelines. So I think we're going to join uh, from Shire. So we're going to start showing you what we have done in the midstream process. In the middle, while we're doing the transition, any questions so far, anything that you might have so far? I think the question from my side is how many of, of the information that I shared actually was new to you, or how many? Is it relatively new? Something that you haven't seen? Just some people nodding. I haven't heard pop computing actually. That's new to me. <laughs> you know, I hope through all this session today you're going to see a very different side of Cisco. And I would say from Cisco you will see more and more of us going into detail of this solution and development. And it's clearly a commitment from a company to invest and make all of this happen. Uh, Core computing is a great example. We will bring innovation, so we're going to share with you. What, what we want to be very clear is that there are things which are forward-looking and futuristic, and I want to make sure that like all computing, to me this is a forward-looking technology, it's coming, but there are also things which are available today, available right now. And I want to make sure 
that you see that we have both of them. So, for example, pipelines that we're going to talk about, this is actually available today. Moreover, uh, together with Schlatter, we actually have developed and have helped customers to, to build new pipelines, upgrade pipelines, and we have some of the examples that we're going to share to you where this solution is already running operation. So this is an example. The same with Emerson. So I'm going to share with you exactly what is available today and uh, some of the installation that we have done already as well. Okay? So okay. Then, just a few words because it's yeah. exactly what I wanted to say. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I will be very short. No, I, I want first to thank, thank you for your, uh, for, for, first for your presence. Uh, I think it's very important also for us to highlight that uh, uh, this silence is very important for us at the Schneider Electric because uh, for such value proposition that we can bring to you, we can do it alone. So we have decided also to, uh, we are used also to, to partnership also with the best professional in the, let's say in the world in this type of, uh, of sector. And definitely Cisco was the best for us. So that, that uh, explains also this uh, alliance. And uh, I, I like the fact also to be very pragmatical. And what I would like to do also is that we, we can work with Mark's team also to, to come and see you also to, to show you what we can propose to you. And uh, I'd like we can be very pragmatic because you may already have some projects that you have in hand uh, for which we would like to work very in advance, work with you to, to propose to you a solution. So 